good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed for gathering for um, a 100th uh, birthday party of note. I noticed that uh, some of you are going to have difficulty squeezing in here. Let me give you a tip that only university librarians know. There actually is a stairway, and you can sit in this balcony. That's how the, those people got up there. So there really is plenty of room uh, for all. It's been uh, 100 years and uh, more than 1,700 cupcakes today. Um, I think that's the figure we're going to remember now that we've said enough about 100 years. And this is a scholarly place. You notice that in the uh, Brown Gallery, uh, the words and pictures of the Californians who made this library are displayed. Perhaps you noticed, you'll certainly have the chance to see this, that we've also assembled a video reel of Hollywood uh, visions of libraries over the years, beginning with Richard Gere walking through Doe Library. <laughs> Doe Library fits best the scripts of Frank Capra in Hollywood, films like It's a Wonderful Life. The film version of Doe begins with the great gift to the university that comes out of the blue. And Chancellor, yes, it's unrestricted. <laughs> After the struggle with a temperamental foreign architect, an architect from New York comes west and rallies everybody behind a glorious design. Then, on a Thanksgiving morning in 1908, the cornerstone is laid and Californians learn the pure motives behind the gift. The library benefactor was hailed for the fact that in a California recession, he would not foreclose on a mortgage. These words were spoken just outside those great bronze doors. You will never hear the widow's sigh echo through these rafters. No orphan's tears will ever moisten Doe's cornerstone. Nor will there be one unclean dollar embedded in these massive walls. For Charles F. Doe had not one cent of that kind of money. So there it is. Proof that the Occupy movement can find early inspiration <laughs> right here. For the rest of us, we can agree uh, with what my predecessor, university librarian, said that Thanksgiving morning. The library will counsel, comfort, stimulate, and inspire. This was true at that time, and it has been proven right over the next century. If you like, you can hold the proof, literally, in your hands. The very books that inspired Californians from the days of the philosopher Josea Rice, Royce, the physicist Robert Oppenheimer, the writer Joan Didion, up to all of us who are about uh, to greet you today. Thank you all for helping us to do this. Happy birthday to Doe. Um, we are in a library. The speakers are introduced in strict alphabetical order. <laughs> but it is a special pleasure to welcome our chancellor, whom I have the first time opportunity to welcome here uh, also as Professor Bergenot. Bob. Boy, does that sound great, Professor Bergenau. <laughs> when life was simple and all I had to do was teach smart freshmen and maybe do a little bit of research. Uh, I don't have to tell all of you, you know, what a special number 100 is. Uh, and actually, a short while ago, three years ago, uh, we celebrated Mary Catherine's mother's 100th birthday. Uh, and and uh, Mary Catherine's mother was at the heart of our combined families. And so today, uh, we have the pleasure of celebrating the 100th birthday of the Doe Memorial Library, which is at the heart of our university. Uh, in planning for the construction of a new library, President 
Benjamin Ide Wheeler wrote in 1904, then they were, there was a president and no chancellors, uh, and he said, the library is a common interest of all departments. In its prosperity is bound up the scholarly fate of the university. Until we have a great library properly housed and administered, we cannot have a great university. This was part of his appeal to Charles Franklin Doe for funding of the library. Fortunately, he was uh, successful and so eloquently and succinctly stated. Today, we have a library of international prominence with incalculable riches that make it one of the world's greatest research collections with over 10 million volumes. The Doe holds a vital place in the teaching, research, and public service mission of the university and is central to our standing as one of the world's preeminent universities and the exceptional community of scholars that are gathered here at Berkeley. The Doe is a special place not only for faculty, but for students, staff, and the greater community. Uh, for me personally, uh, it is where I began my chancellorship, uh, giving my first address to the campus community on the steps of the Doe Library. And my inauguration as chancellor was celebrated in the majestic North Reading Room. So this is very important emotional uh, uh, consequences for us. Uh, this wonderful Morris, Morrison Room, in which we're gathered this afternoon, has been the occasion of many community events, uh, including the inspiring lunch poetry reading series, Bob Hass's reading series, which uh, many of us uh, uh, have, have probably, you, Tom, Mary Catherine, I have, and probably uh, many of the rest of you have had the pleasure of participating in that. I actually managed to find a poem by John Updike about solid state physics and crystals. <laughs> <laughs> Took a long time, but anyway, it was a wonderful uh, uh, poem. Uh, the announcement of the university's largest private gift, which was 110 million from the Hewlett Foundation, for a challenge grant to fund 100 endowed chairs was made here in this Morrison room. It could not have been more symbolically fitting to have Walter Hewlett describe Berkeley as the crown jewel of public higher education, anywhere other than here at the Doe, the intellectual heart of our campus. Many of us will remember the courageous response of the library in showing the Botero exhibit of the disturbing Abu Ghraib paintings that drew visitors from around the world to see this daring exhibition. On the occasion of this centenary, I want to thank the library's leadership, Tom Leonard, and all of the library staff for their exemplary service. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for your support of the library uh, uh, in, in attending this celebration. And thank you for being part of the 100 years of tradition. Before I became chancellor, uh, when I, actually when I was either department head or dean of science, whenever I got fatigued, uh, instead of going out to get a cup of coffee or something like that. I always went down to the library and would just sit there and thumb through physics journals, sort of one after another, to see what I was missing, right? Uh, and I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to that sheer, both intellectual but also tactile pleasure. Uh, the way libraries capture and preserve knowledge in future will continue to evolve because probably now I may not even be able to find the journals, instead I'll have to go to a terminal and I'll have to look online and thumb through them online. Uh, so uh, obviously libraries are evolving, but I'm confident that whatever changes may come, the Doe will continue to serve students and scholars superbly for the next century. So congratulations and happy 100th anniversary birthday, Doe. Thank you, Bob. We have uh, not only a president, but a great friend of the library, someone who's helped us consulting on the Moffitt uh, program for undergraduates, uh, president of ASUC, um, Vishali Lumba. Um, please join us for this birthday party. Thank you. Um, 
After a long day of arduous classes and extracurricular activities, a UC Berkeley student is bound to need a dedicated space to focus their energies and channel their ingenuity for innovation, creativity, and solving problems. For 100 years now, the Doe Library has been able to provide generations of UC Berkeley students with such a haven. The likes of Steve Wozniak, Earl Warren, Jerry Brown, and Eric Schmidt have all walked up the stairs through the gates guarded by Athena to fulfill their academic curiosity. We're gathered here today to cel in celebration of 100 years of providing students, faculty, staff, and visiting scholars the opportunity to further their academic endeavors. I'm honored to be here today and thankful for the opportunity to address, to address you all at such a momentous occasion in the history of the Doe Memorial, Memorial Library. We are all proud to boast the fourth largest university library in the country, which continues to grow our collection every year. As a student, I can attest to what an incredible asset Doe has, has and continues to be for all members of our campus community. Between faculty and alumni, 50 Nobel laureates began their research between the rows of books in North Reading Room. Hundreds of thousands of students have spent countless hours researching and studying in its deep quarters. Politicians, community leaders, world-renowned musicians, and countless others have taken stage on the very steps of Doe Library. Over the past 100 years, Doe Library has been witness to a dynamic campus. Located at the heart of UC Berkeley, it has been and remains to be the epicenter of the UC Berkeley's world-renowned research and academic excellence. And from heated protests to the annual Naked Run, it really has seen it all. With its regal architecture and stunning interior design, Doe Library holds over 52 miles of bookshelves and Gardner main stacks. Holding up to the public nature of the university, the main reading room has and continues to be open to the general public. It has attracted tourists from virtually every corner of the world and been the pinnacle of what makes our campus so breathtakingly beautiful. Drawing from my own personal experience over the past four years, Doe has become a second home to me, especially during midterms and finals week. As a graduating senior, I have to admit, I'm a little sad I won't be able to come back to my favorite cubicle on level B of main stacks next semester. I can only hope that cubicle B32 can do as much good for future generations of Berkeley as it has done for me. This is only the beginning chapter of Doe Memorial Library and its instrumental role in influencing the scholarship of UC Berkeley that UC Berkeley prides itself on. So here's to 100 years and to 100 more. Go Bears. Thank you. In the tradition of very short introductions, the effervescent Annie Barrow's best-selling author. Thank you, Tom. So I, as an author, I do come to Doe Library to do my research. But what I want to talk about today is the bad old days when I was an undergraduate at Cal and the Doe Library stacks were closed to me. Back in that time, if you were an undergraduate, you couldn't get to those books. And so I consequently spent an enormous amount of time and effort as an undergraduate getting into the stacks of Doe Library. I took independent studies that would precipitate stack passes. I wrote a, a thesis on a subject so arcane, I got into the stacks and on the, lower end of the spectrum. I inveigled any TA I could find to write me a day pass. I would do anything to get into those stacks. Now the question, of course, is why? It was not glamour. Back in those days, I'm sure as some of you remember, the um, stacks were two floors of books to one story of building, so that even my head almost touched the ceiling. The shelves were packed, they were dirty, there was no place to sit down. There were a few scratched metal desks with threatening notes from TAs on them about not ever touching anything there. The place was impacted, it was claustrophobic, and I loved it. It was a hive. When I was in there, I felt like I was in a hive, and it was a hive. It was a hive of ideas. It was a place where ideas were being consumed and made. And when I was inside it, 
I was within the community of scholars. I was in the project of my understanding growing. I was inside the machine of learning. Now, when even now, when I go into the Stacks of Doe Library, when the Stacks of Doe Library are now open to all students, graduate and undergraduate alike, where it is a clean, well-lighted place with uh, you know, reasonable ceilings and actual ventilation and places to sit down, I look around and I feel that I am within the community of scholarship. It is still a hive thank God, and I hope that it will continue to be a hive for another 100 years. So happy birthday, Doe Library. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff Nunberg, my colleague from the iSchool, has an unusual, the unusual distinction of inhabiting South Hall, which was the original home of the first books brought to this campus. Um, we took them away, um, but... Um, <laughs> If we had to leave any there, you'd be about the best person to guard them I can think of. Thank you. Thank you. Since, since I'm a, a representative of the I school, I, I thought I'd say a word about the I word and also the K word, knowledge. We don't have a K school, but it's all K school, isn't it? Uh, but most of you probably saw the story uh, last week about uh, how Britannica was discontinuing its, its print edition. Everybody was waxing nostalgic about the disappearance of what had been an emblem of the cultural aspirations of the mid 20th century middle class. Now, you could say, well, it was really no big deal. Britannica was finally just getting out of the furniture business. Um, <laughs> But other people uh, would, would have given it a more uh, uh, auspicious or significant reading um, to hear them tell it this was just part of the inevitable progress to a bookless future. I think of the line at the end of the, the first uh, Back to the Future movie when uh, Christopher Lloyd says to Michael J. Fox, well, what he might have said, books, where we're going, we don't need books. Um, uh, it all, uh, uh, the, the way this is told, it's basically a story about liberation. Um, as John Perry Barlow put it in a widely quoted remark, we don't need books to, to exist anymore in order to get ideas out. We thought we had been in the wine business and suddenly we realized we have been in the bottling business. Uh, uh, right. Uh, with those claims, of course, come all those predictions about the end of the uh, dematerialization of the library. If we don't need the bottles, uh, we certainly don't need the wine cellar. Um, and listening to those people talk, you sometimes have this picture of somebody shaking all the books in the library by their spines until the sentences float loose into space. Um, um, those, those predictions always have that form. This is very typical. Uh, I, I think back to um, uh, a, a picture that appeared in Popular Mechanics in, in 1950 in an article called The Home of the Future. Uh, it showed a woman in an apron in the middle of a living room with all that 50s furniture, and she's spraying it with a hose as the water runs down a drain in the floor. And the <laughs> caption reads, because everything in her home is waterproof, the housewife of the year 2000 can do her daily cleaning with a hose. Um, <laughs> and that's the way these, these representations always work. They focus on the technology du jour and project it in this relentlessly linear way until it's driven everything uh, else from the field. Of course, those uh, uh, futurists couldn't have predicted that just 17 years after the appearance of that picture, a famous line in The Graduate would signal the transformation of the word plastic into a name for all the artificiality of uh, middle-class American culture. And while synthetic materials are, are part of our lives, nobody thinks they're going to drive out uh, natural materials, that dream died with a Corfam shoe, for those who remember it. Um, but the magazine got the, the future wrong in another way, too. Uh, they didn't stop to consider that people 50 years down the road might no longer assume that house cleaning was woman's work, or even that the word housewife uh, might become problematic. And of course, those two fa factors are, are, are connected. It was the affluence and technological, domestic technology of the post-war years 
uh, that contributed a great deal to the, the changes in the uh, middle class American family. Um, in the end, in fact, uh, the future usually surprises us in exactly the opposite ways. Uh, it's, uh, it looks more familiar than we expect, and it turns out to be much weirder uh, underneath. Um, so imagine that John Galen Howard, the architect who supervised the, uh, uh, the construction of the um, uh, of Doe Library, could find himself plopped down in front of it today. He'd be gratified to see it looking basically as it was, the Beaux-Arts facade, the wonderful North Reading Room, uh, and so forth. Maybe it'd be just as well if he didn't look over his uh, right shoulder at Moffat, because that might be, <laughs> that might be disturbing to him. Um, but the, the chairs are, are wood and leather. Uh, um, the, the, uh, the gentlemen are still wearing ties and, and jackets with lapels, uh, something you never see in Buck Rogers or Star Wars uh, movies. Um, uh, and uh, the doors are hinged, unlike the doors, uh, the sliding doors on, on, on Star Trek. Um, in fact, more important, the books are hinged, too. Um, and a lot of them will be hinged for a very long time. Books are a terrific technology. Uh, for certain kinds of work, and particularly the ones that do the cultural heavy lifting, biography, novels, criticism, history, and so forth. People read some of those online nowadays, but it's hard to grasp the arc of a book-length argument or narrative without being able to manipulate an object uh, that's uh, homologous to it. Um, uh, uh, I was in France last summer. I downloaded Madame Bovary to my iPad. It was very difficult. It was like touring Normandy through a bomb site. Um, to, to sort of <laughs> But of course, Howard would also be mystified by some of the things here. Uh, he'd be mystified by the online, ca online catalogs, the digitization uh, of, the, uh, of the collections, uh, the Berkeley Digital Library, the nervous stirrings of distance uh, education, the web itself. Um, and that liberation from materiality, which is what the, the futurists always talk about, turns out to be um, much more problematic than, than they realize. Like those uh, popular mechanics uh, pictures, the techno-futurists uh, techno, techno carry over all these notions about domestic order uh, uh, that don't actually survive the transition. Uh, in fact, those physical libraries and books and collections were doing a lot of work to package and circumscribe and organize all of that information into knowledge. Uh, in the end, it isn't so much a question, it turns out not to be so much a question of breaking the bottles and keeping the wine, as breaking the banks and trying to keep the river. Um, and when people don't recognize that, they make a hash of things. Uh, one example, which I've written about, uh, many of you know, is, uh, is it explains why Google was so inattentive to metadata when they put Google Books together. Uh, all these goofy mistakes that I think many people here have heard about, Madame Bovary and SpongeBob books are under antiques and collectibles, and <laughs> 300 records date, dated before 1950 that mention Medicare and, and, and so forth. G Google talks about its, its, its book search as a library, but as Sergey Brin himself has said, books here, the way they think of them, are basically just another kind of information resource uh, that are going to be incorporated into the greater Google. And if you think of this just as an aggregation of bits of information, uh, then you're not going to worry about the structure of the collection. Uh, you'll do what you do with the rest of the web. You'll just throw in a search term and barrel in sideways. Um, I think that's also the problem with Wikipedia. Uh, they have that pedia suffix, but you have the sense their conception of the encyclopedia was formed when they were doing their eighth grade reports on Egypt. Um, uh, so they always evaluated as an informational resource, we have more, our facts are right, our facts are, your facts are wrong, and so on. Um, what's missing is any image of knowledge itself as an organized, structured domain. Uh, there's a wonderful passage in Jean d'Alembert's preliminary discourse, the Encyclopédie in the, in the 18th century, uh, where he talks about the philosopher who's looking at this vast labyrinth from on high, seeing all relations and connections like a map, he says, with all the countries and the roads between them and so on. But you can't look at Wikipedia from on high, and if you could, the map it would most resemble is one of Germany around the time of the Thirty Years' War. Um, one thing that strikes you about all these visions of the materialized library, it's invariably a place like a place where a neutron bomb has gone off. Uh, there are no footsteps in the stacks. There's nobody there. Um, but of course, all that structure of knowledge um, was produced, uh, was the creation of librarians and lexicographers and encyclopedists. And they're going to be the ones who have to fashion tools for the new epoch. Uh, we can't keep going on with the informational tohu bohu, the, 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 the chaos of Google Books and Wikipedia, 
we also can't reproduce uh, the order of knowledge that's implicit in those artifacts like the old collections and books and, and, and so forth. Uh, so a new system is gonna have to be designed for uh, this new heterogeneous order of knowledge. Nobody knows what it would look like um, or how we'll wind up understanding notions like knowledge or libraries or universities. Um, the, the two things we do know are this. Um, the first is that it will be librarians uh, who are doing this work under whatever job description and on whatever title they are, they are working 50 or 100 years in the future. And the second is that they'll have a very nice building to do their work in. Thank you. Thank you. The finale, and I, I use the term thinking of um, being present when Maxine Hong Kingston led the Cal Band. The finale <laughs> with Earl Kingston and Maxine Hong Kingston begins now. Please come up. Thank you, Jeff, for I, I think something like an introduction to what this is, which is a piece of ephemera that I'm sure not everybody can see, but later you were certainly invited to come up and look at at close range. Um, this is old style. If we were very modern, I'd have this up big and I'd PowerPoint it, and you could see this about 12 times this size. But what it is, is a map that we discovered in our basement, house on Claremont Avenue, after the fire. Our house burned down, and so in 92, we moved down to the flats on Claremont Avenue while our house was being rebuilt, and we discovered this in the basement. And what this is, is a map of campus dating late 20s, early 30s. And it's, it's a beauty, and it's a treasure, and um, we even did a little bit of research on it. But first, uh, Maxine says, for your birthday, I want to give you the present of having this thing restored. So then part of the research was watching the process of having this great map put back together again. And part of the process is soaking it in water to loosen it up. It was torn in half in the basement and rolled up and tattered. It was brought back in a beautiful way with Japanese rice paper and amended and matched. And even, uh, and Karen Zucker, who did the work, said, you know, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. And one of the tools is what we call enzyme-rich liquid. And Maxine and I said, well, what's that? She said, spit. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you use spit? Well, spit has a lot of enzymes that will loosen paste. And so if you're trying to detach something from a surface, spit. <laughs> this map is a timeline as well as a, uh, a map of space. And uh, it is so, um, it's, it's such a, a wonderful coincidence, such synchronicity that uh, we found this map after our fire, which burned everything, our library and manuscripts and book I was working on, everything burned. And then in the basement of this house, we find this map rolled up and torn and the first thing that, that the map begins with, this timeline, is right here. And, and that is the, uh, the fire of 1923. And so the, 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 a map of, of a Berkeley fire of 1923, which was, um, it, it was a, uh, a, a, a an important uh, passage time uh, for Berkeley and for the university and, uh, and the fire of 91 uh, for us. And uh, so appropriate for this celebration today. The Doe Library is right here. <laughs> it's right exactly in the middle. And the rest of the university uh, uh, surrounds it and radiates from it. And then all around the corners, uh, this is what it says. 
This is the map of Berkeley town. Its streets go winding up and down. An oak-covered campus it wears for a crown with people and places of renown. <laughs> um, I thought it, wow, an oak-covered campus. The oak trees everywhere. It means a lot to Berkeley that, uh, that we are surrounded by the eucalyptus trees. I mean, by the oak trees, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking ahead because when I looked at this, I thought, uh, well, where's the eucalyptus trees? And, uh, and it, it's not marked, but I see some tall trees Right there. There, some tall trees. And I figure that those are eucalyptus trees. And um, the eucalyptus grove was, was such a haven uh, for us, you know, to get away from the, the books and the studying. And uh, the eucalyptus grove was where Earl and I had dates. So it's very important. And but looking at the trees um, from my 21st century eyes, uh, I, I looked. To, I found the drawings of the oak trees, and um, and there's a spot right here. There, and there's a, a bunch of oak trees right there, and. Um, they look to my eye as if they've been cut down. And, uh, but then Earl says, no, 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 they're not cut down. That's the way oak trees grow. They you know, kind of grow to the side, and that's what they're doing. But um, it, well, next to those trees that look as if they're on their sides and cut down, um, uh, there's a kid, and he's saying, Mama, what's that? And this woman says, Lacant Oaks, my child. So the oak trees have a name. They're called Lacant Oaks. And, uh, and the way she says it, Lacant Oaks, my child. And I think, wow, uh, this, the, the trees being uh, growing and being cut down. I mean, it's part of the whole uh, history of our University, um, and then next to the, um, uh, the these people talking about the Lacant Oaks, there's um, there, there's an, another person looking out over the campus, and and talking to another one. See, dear, they are rescuing for humanity the native values of rural life. And, um, and as, they, as they look out over the campus, you can see the cows over there. <laughs> yeah. I just love that, the way the, these cartoon figures talk to one another. <laughs> my children, my dear. Uh, maybe professors in those days address their students that way. <laughs> OK, you're going to talk about uh, what you can't locate. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm not> <laughs> um, <laughs> what's lovely is to look at it like a bit of a puzzle in trying to date it. Um, Steve did help us date it in terms of late 20s, early 30s, but interiorly to look at it and to see what hasn't been built, but what's indicated, former or, or future site of the International House, site of the soon to be built Bowles Hall the to-be-built life sciences building. So we know that this is before that. But since there is an indication, a couple of cartoon figures with that hose uh, putting something out and saying, well, no, that was the 23 fire. So it's after 23, but it's before those buildings came up. And this, when we unrolled it in the basement, it, it just brought me back to childhood. When I was a kid, we went to Yosemite, and there was that map of, that Joe Mora did of Yosemite Valley, and he did a lot of cartoon figure maps of California and of Indians, and of Carmel, 
Um, he was a brilliant, brilliant artist. Um, this cartographer's name is Virginia Tooker. We went online, but Wikipedia or anybody didn't have much about her. She's a footnote in a paper on Virginia Woolf. It seems that she lived in Carmel and was part of the arts movement in California in the 20s and 30s. Uh, but outside of that, we don't know. But w one little detail on the map, and you can see right at the tennis court, it shows Helen Jacobs and Helen Wills before she was Helen Wills Moody playing tennis. And my mother always used to say, I hate, I hate Helen Wills, but I love Helen Jacobs. You know, and I didn't know what she was talking about at all. Why, why, do you, how, why can you love one tennis player and, and hate another tennis player? So it was, this is all mixed in with childhood. When I see it on the map, um, and just go from place to place. I, I, you know, you're not, not everybody can get a chance to look at this. It's going to be here for a while. But it's just, it was such a joy to discover this and such a joy to have it put back together again. And it's just great to spend time in front of it. Ephemera is a, is a wonderful term for this, isn't it? Because that's what it is. It doesn't last. And that to come out of a fire and to see this and to have this waiting was just wonderful. You can also try to date it because um, in the stadium, there's, there's a scoreboard and there's a game going on uh, between Cal and Stanford. <laughs> and it tells what's, what the score is at the first quarter. And so if we did some research, uh, we could figure out the date of this map. Apparently a very important game uh, against Stanford. Um, when you know, we just got this map back from the restorer. I mean, we've only had it in our hands for a few hours. And uh, so one of the first thing I, things I did was I looked for the mining circle, which is right in the top there. And there's actually a circle and uh, the mining building. And I looked at that with fear and trembling, the same kind of fear I had when I was an engineering major for three semesters. <laughs> uh, and every, to this day, I pass the mining circle. Oh, actually, I don't go over there. <laughs> and, it, and because, uh, the, you know, when I was there, I was so lost. I, and uh, I, sh I sh Oh, what a mistake. My, uh, my grade point average was going down and down. I almost flunked out because of being in the engineering program. And, uh, and, and the map actually uh, takes into consideration that kind of student fear of, uh, of grades. Um, somewhere to that side of the mining circle, there's a couple of characters and they're talking about their papers. Um, to the side, there, there's uh, letters. It says IQ, IQ, IQ. And then one of them says, um, uh, holding up her paper and complaining to the other student, just as good as Evelyn's and she got an A. <laughs> <laughs> um, Earl and I were here uh, during the free speech movement time. And so we looked to see whether there were, was unrest uh, indicated in this um, uh, a picture. And, um, and, and because we, we were thinking maybe this is around the time of the Depression. Um, but uh, the only unrest uh, was uh, um, the chemistry building. Uh, blows up <laughs> and, uh, and then somebody says, arrested for di disturbing the peace. <laughs> and so that's the only kind of arrest that they were thinking about. Um, over here in this field, there's uh, uh, some soldiers and they're drilling and then um, I thought they were ROTC, but then there's barracks. So maybe there are, um, uh, uh, maybe they were soldiers that were uh, stationed there. Um, oh. oh, just the motto, just the motto, oh. the Latin. 
Oh, why don't you talk about the motto? Okay. Okay. <laughs> what the heck is it? Uh, oh, oh, I, I didn't write it down. Oh, she didn't write it down, and I forgot to bring my notes. It's, okay, it says, it says... She's uh, going to tell me what it says, and I'm going to try to... I Jababit. Yeah, I think it's from the Aeneid, and I think it's forans come... Forans hek olam meminise yuvabit. And in times to come, it will be well to look back and remember these things. It's good that we're ending with the light failing a bit, because one of the things we realized in working on the history of Doe is that it actually was the first library on campus provided with the facility of allowing people to read in the evening. And if my source is correct, it was Levi Strauss who contributed uh, in part to that effort to make this a modern library as it remains today. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>